What do we have here? It's the almighty trencher jeep. Yes, that's right. We finally have gotten a trencher jeep. I've been looking for one of these things for years and years. Uh, you don't really see these things pop up very often. And when you do, they're so derelict and expensive and far away that it's just not feasible to go get one. Luckily, I found this little CJ5 for sale, only about four hours away. It was a pretty good price, actually, so I was like, you know, I shouldn't buy it, but I should buy it because it's definitely a bucket list item to own one. So I decided, you know what, we're going to go ahead and get the thing. What these Jeeps were is called an Agri Jeep, where you bought a standard Jeep from Willys, this one being a CJ5, and then they have this big catalog of optional accessories that you could buy. This particular CJ5 has what they call an Auburn Trencher on it. There are two different style trenchers built for these Jeeps. The early style, which would be for like a flat fender, a CJ2A, 3A, the entire trenching mechanism hung off the back of the tailgate here. This is later, they call it the gear hydraulic trencher because it has a little bit of hydraulics, a little bit of gear mechanisms inside of it. The benefit to this style is that half of the weight is sort of in the bed of the Jeep rather than hanging out the back. That way the load supported a little more evenly, a little bit better in your suspension, chassis, stuff like that. Because trencher Jeeps are known to crack the frames in half and just, I mean there's a lot of stress coming off of this giant mechanism. I am completely new to trencher Jeeps in general. I've never owned one, never really learned about them too much in mechanical detail. So what I've sort of figured out is this has a steering wheel lock on it. So what you do is when you're in the Jeep, you ready to start trenching, you throw the steering wheel lock on it that keeps the Jeep going nice and straight. Then you come back here and here are your little levers. If you look underneath the trencher Jeep, you're gonna find something pretty interesting. There's a gear that comes off the back of the PTO up here. Then there's a gear on the emergency brake drum on the transfer case. So when you're driving the Jeep with the trencher running, you effectively have a much lower gear ratio because the trencher is running the Jeep off of the rear axle. It's not going through the transfer case system. The Jeep can go a lot slower than the factory crawl ratio because the factory crawl ratio, you're going so fast that the trencher just wouldn't have time to dig in. A lot of these Jeeps also have a half cab system on them. This one's actually made by Coing Ironworks, which is a super common top for these things. Trencher Jeeps also typically have a plow on them because after you trench your trench, then you can use a plow to flatten everything back out. Now this trencher is not running a long, long time, obviously. You can uh, tell that uh, she's been a little derelict. The guy I bought it from only owned it for a very short time. I want to take this thing and I just want to trench the yard once, you know. Have my fun with it, say I did it, say I own one, and uh, then I'm done with it. And his thought was the same thing, but he had so many projects going on, didn't have time to mess with it, which I completely understand. It only took about four hours of the snail's place to remove the engine. I was kind of curious before I pulled it what kind of clutch it would have on it. This appears to be the heavy duty, I think it's a nine and a quarter inch clutch and pressure plate, just a little bit bigger. You see the pressure plate goes all the way to this outside edge, whereas the smaller pressure plates and clutches actually bolt in a lot closer. So that is a heavy duty style. Looks pretty barren here, but next up what we're gonna do is Go ahead, let's get all the shifter shifting inside of this. I kind of beat this around with the hammer a little bit. I got that one shifting. Not the easiest, but it is moving. This one's about halfway there, and tranny's done. Probably gonna have to end up pulling this little tower right here to just pop this whole shifter out. We've got our two engines sitting right here, the one we took out and the one that we're putting in. About ready to be done for the night. However, I did go ahead and do some preventative work for tomorrow and the following days. I used the hammer to just kind of gently tap this lever down here and then at the end of the shift rail. Now that shifts and that shifts. The PTO lever did not want to shift at all, so I took the lever off, which we can see 
right here, just a little fork. And I've sprayed some PB Blaster down in the hole where the shift lever is. We'll let that soak tonight. Then I've gone ahead and used some sprayable chain lube. That is uh, this stuff right here. Went ahead and just sprayed the chains that are right here and right here, not this outside chain. From what I understand, this chain, I mean, it's always in the dirt. So you put oil on there, the dirt's gonna cling to that oil and just grime it up. But I figured, let's go ahead and get this stuff soaking. So that way we don't accidentally break the chain because that would not be fun. I also lubricated the chain back there. This whole thing spins and it's kind of crazy because it's massive and this hose hangs right there. Spraying stuff and lubricating. I did discover something. There's a lever right here that you pull or push in and out. And I believe this is what engages that gear system on the transfer case. Check this thing out. That is not good either. Yeah, this clutch is junk. We're finally ready to put the new engine in. This one also came out of the CJ5. This engine bay is all open, ready to go. And what I usually do when I'm putting in an engine, you gotta remove this bell housing inspection plate. That way you can see the input shaft of the transmission while you're pushing the engine close to it. And typically I use a forklift to get the engine in over the engine bay, get it close. And then I use a porta power to push off this cross member against the engine and push it onto the input shaft because that's, you know, it's hard to do with just one person. And it's one of those things where it goes really easy in about 15 minutes or it takes an hour. There's no in between. That took no time at all. The engine is in its basic position. Now is the fine tuning that we can't really do with the forklift because the thing just moves way too easy. I'm gonna go ahead and put that port of power up front and push on the front of the engine all while looking in the inspection plate hole. Now I'm not saying these tires are a major upgrade. They definitely have their fair share of dry rotting and cracks on the sidewall, but they are a big advantage over that. Go ahead and give her a shot and see what happens. We are 100% ready to go for the first test drive. I went ahead, I got the throttle linkage all sorted out on this thing, it was a little bit of a mess. Got oil, antifreeze, fuel lines, temporary fuel tank while we're waiting for the one to come from Amazon. Even got excited and made my own seat here. Let's see, steering wheel wrapped in tape, battery, wiring. Like I said, we should be ready to rock here. Sure runs a heck of a lot better now that I got the firing order figured out. I don't know how, but one of the spark plugs got switched around, I believe number two and three. Now it uh, runs a lot better than what it did. We did have a little bit of smoke pouring out of this thing. We're gonna go ahead and we're just gonna let it run for a little bit and uh, make sure everything's checking out pretty good. It seems to uh, drive around somewhat decent. Uh, definitely pretty heavy with that trencher back there. I mean, you could really feel it. I don't think people realize how heavy these are. I think it's around 1,800 pounds. So you're almost doubling the weight of the Jeep you know, between the, the trencher and the front plow, which is kind of crazy. And you, you can really feel it back there. I feel like it'll almost pop a wheelie if I wanted to.
Now that the engine's all warmed up, it's definitely smoking a lot more than what it did. But this is probably one of those Jeeps that you use once or twice a year, so I don't think that matters too bad. Now that we know this thing runs and dries pretty well, we're going to start working on the actual trencher portion here. Problem is, all these levers are extremely stuck. What we found is there's a couple bolt holes you can vaguely see. There's one here, one here, and one here. Uh, the bolts on the inside are what holds this entire mechanism on that connects all these linkages. I'm going to go ahead, unbolt that, disconnect the linkages, and take this whole assembly out so we can clean it and get this thing moving again. I've never looked inside of one of these before, but it seems relatively simple. Not much going on inside of there. I had to actually cut these pins to get them out. Today we're going to fix two issues with the old trencher Jeep. Issue number one is our choke. Little unorthodox. Issue number two is the fuel tank. CJ5 fuel tank. Brand new and all of her glory. I bought one of those and the gasket to put it together and then also new choke cable. What they've got going on in here is actually a passenger seat. On that side you can see that it tips up like a passenger seat would. I'm assuming they lost the driver's seat and robbed that from over here. I'll put some gas in the thing, got the video camera all ready, hop in it. Push the clutch pedal and it sticks at the floor again. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. When I go to let off the clutch, the brake pedal was kind of hitting the floor and it was hanging back the clutch. And they're both moving together. So I thought, well, I'll take the brake pedal arm off. I'll clean everything, put it back on. I cannot get that sucker off. You know, it's going to be a job for another day. And now I just pulled the little pedal itself off. That way it can't get caught against the floor and it should run and drive just fine. While I was under there playing with linkages, I was messing with the linkage that connects the clutch to the back of the trencher, which it's pretty big. I mean, it's just a rod with some threads on it. I thought, well, while we're adjusting the clutch, this thing probably needs adjusted as well. But the thing just snapped right off of there. So it's going to need a new rod. The original plow control cable used to sit right here, T-shaped handle, you pull it in and out. I want something that was kind of original, but something that I could work with. And that's how I settled on this cable. This is a Dorman 52201. This thing, I can't remember, I think it's about 18 feet long. I did that because I want to be able to route it through the firewall around this fender and then it's got to come out. Uh, the original actually came out through the grill and then out through here. I figure we'll get this one routed somewhat how we think we need it and then we can just cut off the excess. The new cable is installed at the dash. Look at all that action we've got going on. Plenty to work with here. We got a little bit extra cable to work with. I wish I'd have went a little bit shorter because we've got to be a solid, solid five feet. It's been a long and productive day for the old trencher Jeep. I finally got the new plow pump all mounted. By new, I mean a pump that uh, Bob from the CJ2A page sold me. A replacement pump's about 450 bucks all rebuilt. He sold me this one for 100 bucks plus shipping. It actually fit in a large flat rate box, so I got it shipped for about $22. Not bad at all. So what you got are two wires. You have a power wire and a ground wire. The ground can go anywhere you want. The power wire goes to a solenoid. Up here on the fender, which I also had to replace, the old one didn't work. So the power goes to one side, and then it's just like a starter where you turn a key switch, you know, the starter motor turns. Well, it's the same exact thing because that is a starter motor off of a Willys truck. So you ask yourself, okay, there's a starter motor on there. It goes up, then what? Well, to go down, it's actually a gravity down. And there's this little piece that twists. So ideally, if you had all the hardware of the cable, you hook the cable on this. And when you pull the cable on the dash, it pushes this and the pump gravity feeds down. Because of that system, unfortunately, you have the plow up and then you pull this cable for it to go down. Kind of awkward to have two different switches. I did see back in the day they had one big switch that had where you pulled it and went gravity down, but when you pushed it, it activated a switch behind the dash, but unfortunately, I do not have that. Let's see this bad boy go up.
awesome. Two hours later, we have finally extracted the PTO unit that attaches to the back of the transfer case. As you can see, it's not looking very good. That is obviously why it's not shifting, because the thing is just absolutely gunked with rust, and it's not even spinning at all. To the left is the PTO we took out of the Jeep. To the right is the one we're putting in. Quite a big difference right there. When it sits in the Jeep, this thing kind of rotates around, and then a bolt holds that up into place here. So just like so. Our next step is go ahead and just power wash this thing. It's been filthy. All kinds of little stuff growing on it. So obviously we're going to use some super clean to clean up all this nasty grease and gunk. We're going to have to be working inside of here next and I just don't want to get my hands all filthy and grimy for no reason. Something you might not think about when you're working on an old trencher is go ahead and put some grease in all those old bearings. With the rear caps off, there's a greaser here, 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 and here. Then as you move up the trenching unit, there's one on either side over here. There's also one on either side up here. And on the inside of the trencher unit itself, it's kind of tricky looking in here for all these things. There's one on either side of this, where the bearings are that run this thing. There's also one up here for this lever. And lastly, there's one up here. This one's kind of tricky, it's over here, and uh, I'm assuming it runs the bearing that runs on the outside of this. There's a better look at the bearing on this large rotating assembly. Been soaking these control levers for a while. Believe it or not, this actually started out as white vinegar, and it's got all the nasty dirt and grime and grease all clumping up around the surface here. And the surface is almost a crust over the entire bucket. I let it soak for a few weeks, pulled it out, and I started hitting these with a hammer back and forth. A lot of these were just a little bit of tapping. This one was a lot of force getting it to go back and forth. And I knew I wasn't going to be working on the Jeep for another couple weeks. So I went ahead, threw this back in here, now that they got them moving, and maybe some of that vinegar could get in more of the deeper pockets. It's definitely, look how disgusting this stuff is. That's what nightmares are made out of. With the shifter assembly all cleaned up, we can really see how nice it is that they're soaking it in that white vinegar. And I'd say soaking it the second time was really the key to making this all work really nice. And look how easy this lever moves. This one moves easy as well, this one as well. Now this one has a spring assembly on the back side right there. You can see it moves just like that. All right, we're about to set her on. That looks pretty good. So I've got the levers all hooked up. Things seem to be working pretty well. Like there's the boom, up and down, the travel speed. Lever seems to be doing its thing. You cannot engage the chain until the clutch is out on the Jeep. Yeah, what do I mean by that? Well, if you pull this, it actually controls the clutch pedal on the Jeep right back here. Let's see if we can't capture it. I'll go ahead, I'll push it out. There's the clutch is moving. The clutch pedal works the traditional style of going to the bell housing of the transmission, but it also has a rod that extends all the way back to the rear end of the Jeep, past the rear bumper actually, and it's got this little swivel, and I've missed a grease point when I was going ahead and doing the rest of this the other day. In the center of the camera there, you'll see a little bit of a spring and there's a block. That block is actually stopping this from rotating. You kind of see that pin hitting against it right there. When this goes so far, it flips uh, a block down there, and then when you push this back, it's spring-loaded to return back to its initial position, which is why this thing is stuck right now. And what I've done next is after realizing we can possibly test this thing tonight, I went ahead and looked up this little plate right here. This is a Vickers uh, power pack system, kind of universal for the era. Found a parts diagram. They said that this piece back here is the dipstick slash fill. 
So I went ahead and filled up this uh, hydraulic reservoir tank to, it was about that far from the top, it filled really quickly. And then I went ahead and there are two dipsticks back here. One for here, one for here. And I knew this needed gear oil because on the diagram of this piece, there's a gear that sticks out on the end and that gear is being turned by these Auburn gear boxes. So there's a fill here with its respected dipstick back here and then there's a dipstick here with the fill plug way back here. Now this piece I'm not 100% confident because it's got the grease circ on top but this also extends down below the floor of the Jeep with the gearbox system. I pulled this plug and topped off gear oil. It was already kind of down here so it didn't take much at all. The only unknown part is if the hydraulic oil is bled still from back in the day or if it is not. Then obviously this belt has seen better days. It's all dry rotted and cracked. But hey, if we can't get the same turn just a little bit, I will be 100% satisfied. Dad said he didn't want the old boom crashing down on its concrete, so we have the forklift in place as a safety mechanism in case the whole boom tries to fall down. It'll land right on the forks right there. Look at that. 